I was asked to pick a 20th century building that I really liked. Now, when you ask something like that, the mind turns to the grand and the mighty, to the big monuments, to the big guys. But I've come here not because it's great, nor even because I like it. I don't know about that yet. This is what we're going to find out. It's one of the best examples of modern council housing. It's big and it's small. It's cheap and cheerful. It's cheeky and it's clever. It's kind of like a pomegranate. It's fruity, hard edges and soft, sweet places inside. This is the biker wall. Really, it's a hard, thick skin. It's also an architectural epic, a legend. It was designed by Ralph Erskine in the late 60s as the first phase of a slum clearance programme. His prototype was the walled city, an arctic fortress, a barricade against the winter weather. But the biker walls are defence against that inclement characteristic of British cities, the motorway. A wall is a wall is a wall, until you walk through it or live in it. Inside, these streets in the sky are safe and secure. They face the light and the landscape. For people who once had no horizon beyond somebody else's roof, here there's free access to the sky and the cityscape. And that's a gift, isn't it, that architecture can contribute to a community. For a neighbourhood that once looked into nowhere but a backyard, there's real pleasure and privilege in the possession of this landscape. Before they built the new biker, it was leafless, a warren of treeless terraces packed with the back-to-backs that seemed to be the essence of this city. Biker began with a tree bank. It's got a fifth of the city's total trees, and it's got 3,500 beds of shrubs and flowers. Each pip in the pomegranate grows and grows and grows. So much so that sometimes the people feel crowded out or that the trees are stealing their light. And so they get them felled. Philistines? Not necessarily. This is an expression of bikers' democracy. This is public housing. And although the public who live here aren't owners, they are organised and they get to influence the environment beyond their own front door or their own front gate. This building, for instance, was going to be here, but the people protested, so it's here. Private spaces merge with the public. There's nowhere marooned, doomed, undefended or indefensible. And you've got to look really hard to find anywhere that's wrecked or graffiti, because people aren't diminished by the place. And people, particularly little people, seem to take possession of the public spaces and make them their own. this mean for architecture? Is it modernist or postmodernist or what? For sure it abolishes aggressive phallic architecture, all those grey erections which puncture the skyline. Maybe it's vulval architecture. It's round, it goes with the contours of the landscape, it's an enclosure rather than a disclosure, full of nooks and crannies, layers and levels and surprises. 
Biker breaks with 60s brutalism, bought off the shelf by post-war Britain. It broke too with an older barbarism, the private and profitable back-to-backs, which ironically became emblematic of plebeian homesteads. Erskine's biker had to match the density of the old back-to-backs which housed over 9,000 people. But every dwelling beyond the wall has access not only to its backyard, but to some other shared, secret garden. The new units were compact, certainly on the small side, and cheap. This may not be architecture as art, but it's infinitely artful. The plastic balconies to maximise the light, the blue tin roofs that cheer up a landscape that once was doer, and the wood roof panels. They're all ingenious design solutions, but more than that, they're clever economic compromises to meet the stiff cost constraints imposed on public housing. They look flimsy and flighty, but for all their fragility, they've had remarkable stamina. They've been up for more than 15 years, and they give a fresh inflection to the meaning of modernism. This is the new age of plastic and paint. There's humour here, and a kind of honesty. It is what it is. There's no mock Tudor or Georgian grandeur to give dignity to a boring suburban semi. The project's tribulations come less from the non-traditional design and the unorthodox materials than from economic mistakes and political mismanagement. The district heating system, for instance, is expensive and inflexible. It's a folly of its time. But Biker doesn't suffer from many of the epidemics of British housing, like condensation. British homes leak heat, like shedding tears. But that's not so so much in Biker because of the unorthodox design. And then there's repairs. That word is the tenant's lament everywhere. Contractors hired by the council take weeks and weeks, near months, to fix things. And that drives a person crazy. The crusade against council homes means that tenants, unlike owner-occupiers, enjoy no subsidy, no tax relief. So although Biker is the most popular council estate in Newcastle, people leave because it costs more to live here than on this subsidised private estate. Contractors and direct works are geared up to 40,000 traditional homes, not 2,000 with tin roofs. And yet Biker's a pioneering kind of public housing, which isn't just user-friendly, it's worker-friendly. This is an epic development. Street by street, the old slums were cleared, while street by street, the new Biker was built. It's flawed, of course, but at least, unlike most of its contemporaries, there's a bit of democracy here. It's both monumental and modest. It's a social space and domestic. There's something light-hearted about this place, something lovable. <laughs> Thank you.